Now we are turning in our Bibles this morning to the passage we've read together from the Gospel according to Luke, the passage beginning at verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. The other day, like most of you, I was thinking about Christmas, and as I thought about Christmas, for some unknown reason, there came into my memory the opening line of Charles Dickens' great novel, A Tale of Two Cities. I suppose the opening words of A Tale of Two Cities are among the best words, best known words, certainly, in all English literature. And I suppose this reveals my state of mind at the time. They struck me as being a fine expression of this season of the year for so many people. The book, of course, begins with these words. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. For some of us, this is, I suppose, the best of times. How many people will say to us, haggard faces, pale faces, of course, it's a wonderful time for the children. And it is a wonderful time for the children and all who inwardly, and I hope this includes all of us, all who inwardly retain something of the child. But it's also, and all of us recognize this, for some people at least, the worst of times. It is, for almost all of us, the worst of times financially. But for many of us, it is also the worst of times emotionally. And indeed, if the truth were told, for many people, it turns out to be the worst of times spiritually. But for most of us, I imagine, it is both the best of times and the worst of times. Those two things, in a strange way, in many people's lives, are intermingled at Christmas time. And if I am not mistaken by my masculine observation, it strikes me that that is frequently true for those who are mothers. It is the best of times, and it is also the worst of times. From one point of view, it might seem a terrible thing to admit that about Christmas, except that it was so obviously true of the first Christmas, and so obviously true of the experience of the Virgin Mary. It was the best of times, and yet it turned out almost to be the worst of times. And yet the worst of times turned out for her to be the best of times. And Christmas, indeed, the first Christmas for the Virgin Mary, turned out, as for so many of us, to be both the worst of times and also the best of times. And she stands in Scripture, I suppose, as one of the great biographies by which God teaches us the ways in which He is able to turn the worst of times into the best of times. What is so remarkable about her story, as Luke records it in chapter 1 of the Gospel, is the way in which the experiences she went through did indeed turn out to be for her, spiritually, the best of times. They must have been for her to be able to say the kind of thing she does in Luke 1, verse 46, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And she indeed in the passage, the Magnificat as we usually call it, explains to us what it was that brought her to rejoice in this way in God as her Savior and thus to glorify the Lord. It was, she tells us in verse 48, because he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. The reason the worst of times became for her the best of times 
was because she had the spiritual insight and illumination to recognize the ways in which God was mindful of her condition, the ways in which God was coming to her in what was potentially not only an embarrassing situation, but a disastrous situation for her, the ways in which God came to her and gave her solid encouragements that enabled her to praise the Lord. And those solid encouragements, as it happens, are all to be found in the passage beginning at verse 26 and ending at verse 38, that is entitled, at least in the New International Version, The Birth of Jesus Foretold. And I want you to notice that while in the course of the Christmas narrative, there are many more encouragements actually given to the Virgin Mary than we find here. In this passage, there are four very solid encouragements for her and for us that turn potentially the worst of times for her into the very best of times. And I want us to take a moment to look at each of these encouragements which God gives to her in order to stabilize her in one of the most shattering experiences of the whole of her life. The first encouragement, obviously, was this. It came in the form of the angel who came from the presence of the Lord. Her first encouragement came in the form of the angel who visited her from the presence of the Lord very clear from the birth narrative of our Lord Jesus that the first Christmas was an unusually busy time for angels. We read of angels visiting the shepherds. We read of angels visiting Joseph at various times. We read of an angel who had already come to visit Zechariah. And now we have this angel once again coming to visit the Virgin Mary. And the interesting thing about this narrative is that here, for once, the angel is actually named. This is a particular angel whose name, as we are told here, is Gabriel. And Gabriel is the angel who had come already in Luke chapter 1 to visit Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, to tell him about the coming birth of John, although Elizabeth had long been barren. And Gabriel is the same angel who visited the great Daniel in Babylon on two separate occasions and similarly gave Daniel strength and illumination and encouragement for times of crisis. And it rather seems from the occasions in which Gabriel is mentioned that Gabriel's special ministry as an angel of God is to be the herald and interpreter of God's saving purposes. At least whenever Gabriel appears, the message that he brings is a message about God's saving purposes which he comes to interpret for God's people. Now, there's something that I think is important for us to notice in this connection. And that is that the Scriptures do teach us, as Christian believers, seriously to believe in the activity of angels. The angels of God, says the author of Hebrews, have been sent to the people of God as ministering spirits to them. But while the Scriptures encourage Christian believers to believe in the ongoing ministry of angels, by contrast, the Scriptures very rarely speak about the visible appearance of angels. There are only a handful of periods of time in the 2,000 years which the Bible history covers There are only a handful of times in all of those years when angels actually visibly make their appearance to men and women. 
So although the Scripture teaches us that there is an ongoing activity, an invisible activity of angelic ministry, the Scriptures are very sparse in recording occasions when men and women saw those angels and experienced, as Mary does here, a conversation with an angel sent from God. And the really significant thing about this occasion, as about all of those other occasions, is that these angels appear. They not only minister, but they actually appear to the people of God in times when the kingdom of God is at a point of immense crisis. That was the case with Daniel. That was the case earlier on with Zechariah and the birth of John the Baptist. That is the case every single time in the ministry of Jesus in which we read about the presence of angels. It is always when the ministry of Jesus is at a great crisis point. At his birth, in his wilderness temptations, in his agony in Gethsemane, in his dying upon the cross, in him being sealed in the garden tomb, in his ascending to the right hand of the Father and his coming again in glory. Angelic appearance always accompanies great crisis for the kingdom of God and for the people of God. And the reason the angels who constantly minister occasionally appear is to encourage the people of God in times of crisis to believe that all the resources of heavenly power are behind them and supporting them and strengthening them. Indeed, the name Gabriel actually means God who manifests His strength. And this is the first encouragement that God is giving to the young virgin Mary. Probably a girl in her mid-teens. He is coming to her in this angelic appearance, not just in angelic ministry, but in angelic revelation. And even particularly in the angel whose name is Gabriel. To say to her, that with all the burden that God is placing upon her shoulders and quite literally is placing within her womb, she may be confident in knowing that all the resources of God are available for those who are His servants in the service of His kingdom. God who gives Mary and indeed all of His people The burden of his special service is the God who places at their disposal all the resources of the strength of heaven. And so Mary is encouraged in the midst of this situation to look not to her own resources which are so frail and feeble, not to her own wisdom which, humanly speaking, is so immature but to look to the God who has sent the angel whose very name speaks the truth that God is the strength of his people and to find in this angel who came from the presence of God the assurance to her of the strength and the power of God to enable her. But then there is a second way in which God gives encouragement to Mary. And this comes not so much from the angel who appears from the presence of God, but from the Spirit who comes to do the work of the Lord. This is the message that Gabriel gives to her in verses 31 to 33. He says to her, you will give birth to a child, and his name will be Jesus. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And Mary, a virgin, inevitably says, verse 34, How can this possibly be? This is quite impossible, she says. This is quite impossible because I am a virgin. And Gabriel, who has given her the message 
of the coming birth of Jesus now gives to her the explanation of how it will be that Jesus will be born. Verse 35, he says, What will happen is this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High, notice these words, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One who will be born will be called the Son of God. Now, the significant thing for us to notice here is the promise that Gabriel gives that the Holy Spirit will overshadow the Virgin Mary. He will, of course, overshadow the Virgin Mary as a kind of sign that what God is doing in this virgin conception is hidden behind closed doors. It is beyond the understanding of men and women. It is a secret, divine miracle. And so it is as though God places a keep-out notice over the womb of the Virgin Mary and says that this will take place in the hidden recesses where no man's eye can look and where no human mind can understand. But the language that Luke uses is much more significant than that. And we know it's more significant than that because the verb he uses for overshadow is a verb that's used in the Bible, both in the Greek translation of the Old Testament and by Luke himself in the Gospel, only in very special occasions. It's the verb that was used to describe the way in which God came, you remember, in the Old Testament days, in the cloud that came to be known as the Shekinah, the cloud of God's glory, the cloud that first overshadowed the people of God as they made their way out of Egypt in the Exodus, the cloud that filled the holy place when God came to visit His people. It was a bright physical cloud that was a physical manifestation of the brightness of God's glory. The only other place in which Luke uses it very significantly is in the description of the transfiguration of Jesus. In the transfiguration of Jesus, you remember we're told by Luke that a cloud overshadowed them. And he uses the language that the Old Testament had used about the overshadowing of the glory cloud of the presence of the Lord. That is to say, the reason why Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration was because the cloud came, the cloud of God's glory came, and he entered into the cloud of God's glory so that when he appeared to the disciples, they saw the glory of the Lord reflected on his face. And that's what Gabriel, Luke, wants us to understand, is really saying to the Virgin Mary, not just that God will bring about the conception of his son in her womb behind closed doors, but that what will take place in her womb will be that the very glory of God will once again come into the world. From all we know of this little circle of friends and relatives, Mary almost certainly would have grasped the significance of that in terms of the great prophecy of Ezekiel in the Old Testament. You remember how at the beginning of Ezekiel's prophecy, he is this vision of the glory cloud of the Lord rushing out of the temple and the glory of the Lord departing from his people. And then he has this vision of what God is going to do in the future. And the vision is centered upon the fact that he sees the glory cloud of the Lord returning to the temple. And this is what Mary is to understand. God is going to do beginning in her life, beginning in her womb. 
He is going to begin that new work so that men and women who have, as Paul says, sinned and fallen short of God's glory, over whose lives the word Ichabod, the glory has departed, has been written, so that in this baby who is to be born, in this baby the glory of God will return and the glory of God will be most wonderfully restored. And you can see how this message is intended for her encouragement. Not only will God give to her the resources of heaven to enable her to bear her great burden, but the burden that she is to bear is no other burden than being the mother of the one in whom the glory of God will be restored. That's what Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians 4, isn't it? When he says that in the face of Jesus Christ we have seen the glory of God. That's what the Apostle John says in his great exposition of the incarnation in John 1. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this young maiden whose whole life seems to have been bent upon bringing to pass the glory of God, is encouraged both by the knowledge of his strength and in the second place by the assurance of his restored glory. But then there is a third thing, and in many ways this is the sweetest thing of all. There is a third encouragement that is given by the angel Gabriel to Mary. And that is not just now the presence of the angel who comes from the Lord or the promise of the glory that will be restored in her womb. This third source of encouragement comes from her cousin or relative who lives in the highlands of Judea. And you'll notice these angels, if I may say so, know a thing or two. You'll notice that she is told in verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And you can see he's not simply imparting information to her here as he flies out the door, like some husband who, when he hears about a baby, knows that a baby has been born, but doesn't know what size it is, what it weighs, what color it is, whether it looks like mother or father, or even what name it is. All, all men usually know about babies that have been born is that they've been born. What else is of importance? What sex they are, what size they are, what shape they are, what color, nothing's important. But to women, it seems these things are of great importance, and angels know better than most husbands, it seems. And he's not simply passing on a birth notice. He's saying to her, God is giving you something in your relative Elizabeth in order to encourage you to believe, verse 37, that nothing is impossible with God. And the next thing we know, do you notice that in verse 39? The next thing we know is at that time, Mary got ready and notice the verb. She hurried, she hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea and greeted Elizabeth. Now, why did she hurry? Well, she hurried, I presume, for several reasons. She hurried probably, first of all, simply in order to escape. It's difficult at times to place together Luke's account of the infancy narrative, and Matthew's account of the infancy infancy narrative, when exactly does one thing happen and when does another thing happen? Is she hurrying away here because she hasn't even told Joseph? Is she hurrying away here because Joseph's been told, but Joseph, as we read in Matthew, has decided to divorce her? She is hurrying away in order to escape from an unbearable situation. She's hurrying away, and you can see the kindness of God in this. She's hurrying away to another woman who's expecting a child. 
I suppose expecting a child is a bit like breaking your arm. When you break your arm, you discover all kinds of... You keep bumping into people who have broken their arms. You could almost, you could almost form a broken arm society. And it's the same, I imagine, with women who are expecting babies. How marvelous to be able to share your experiences with someone else who is in the same condition you are. But more than that, and the clue to this is found in verse 48. Mary's song tells us that she said, He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And while we can take those words at their face value, we are intended to understand that Mary is actually putting herself in a particular biblical category by using these words. These are actually words that form an echo of the prayer of Hannah, the mother of Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And they place Mary in a whole category of Old Testament women. Women for whom it was apparently impossible that they should have a child, but by God's supernatural intervention became the mothers of sons who had a specific ministry in God's kingdom, beginning with Sarah, going on in the Old Testament to someone like the wife of Manoah, the mother of Samson, going on in the Old Testament to somebody like Hannah, going on still in the Old Testament, of course, to somebody like Elizabeth. It's of great significance that the Scripture tells us that Elizabeth was barren. Elizabeth was apparently incapable of having a child. No one expected her to have a child. And here, in a sense, is the climax of what God is doing through these women. In the case of these other women, they are women who have been barren. In the case of Mary, she is a young woman who is a virgin. But because she is a woman in whom God is working in the same way He has worked in Elizabeth, God in the wonder of His providence. Can, can you imagine how kind this is of God? That the mother of John the Baptist, who would be the forerunner of Jesus, in God's gracious kindness was to be born into a family and of a mother who was known personally to the mother of our Lord. And she could go to her and share with her. Share with a woman who, as we're told in verse 25, knew what it was to experience disgrace among the people, as Mary would experience disgrace among the people so that she would find in the encouragement of the people of God, in the encouragement of her relative Elizabeth, the kind of succor, the woman-to-woman -woman talk by which God would see her through the ministry to which He had called her. I said there were four things, but there's time only for three. But these three will do us, will they not? The knowledge that in what God does in the worst of times to turn them into the best of times is to come to us and assure us that all the resources of the strength are in, of heaven are ours for the service to which He calls us. To know, as the Virgin Mary knew, that the work that God does in and through us is a work that He does by the power of the Spirit of the glory of God. And to know that in the service to which He calls us, He surrounds us so appropriately so often by the people of God who have seen the hand of God in their own lives and who are able to share with us 
whatever the worst of times may become for us, are able to share with us the great truth of God's Word, that with men and women many things are impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. And so whether we be Christians or non-Christians, we find ourselves in the light of this passage in the same position as the Virgin Mary. There is the announcement of the coming of a Savior. And the question is, in view of the costliness, in view of the burden, do we receive him gladly or turn away from him? Do we respond to him in the Virgin's words, may it be to me just as you have said? And are we able to do so because we have some consciousness that all the resources of God are placed at the disposal of his purposes in his people? That's surely enough to lead us to say, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, if you come to a young woman like the Virgin Mary and shower your grace upon her with such wisdom and kindness and display your resources to her with such favor, Will you not also come to us and to the neediest and lowliest of us and shower upon us the riches of your grace that for us this season of the year, whatever it may mean in all other respects, may become for us spiritually the very best of times. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.